across regions. The Milken Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank that focuses on three key areas, finance, health, and philanthropy. Through our programs and projects around the world, we're committed to improving access to capital, increasing access to health innovations, and optimizing the deployment of philanthrop philanthropic dollars. I would like to thank His Majesty's Trade Commissioner, Natalie Black, for, for her support in helping make this event happen, and also for her energy, commitment, and dedication over the, the last few years to support business and trade. She's an important emissary uh, between the United Kingdom and the Asia Pacific region. The Milken Institute would also like to thank the British High Commissioner to Singapore, Cara Owens, for this opportunity and for her, her team's support. Finally, I should note that as with all the sessions that we have had uh, this week, uh, all our public sessions, there will be no Q&A. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming High Commissioner Owens to the stage. Good evening, everybody, and thank you, Laura, so much for your warm welcome and for all of your help in uh, putting this event together. Um, Enormous thanks to Milken for hosting. I think if you're going to make an early speech in this region, doing so at Milken's Asia Summit is a really great place to do it. It's my honor to introduce uh, the British Foreign Secretary, the Right Honorable James Cleverly, MP. He has had a whirlwind three weeks in his role. Shortly <laughs> after his appointment, uh, he was welcoming leaders from around the world who kindly came to the UK to pay their respects to Her Late uh, Majesty the Queen. He then went quickly off to New York to attend the United Nations General Assembly High Level Week. And then just touching base back in the UK over the weekend, this week he has already been in Japan and the Republic of Korea, and now he is in Singapore. I am in awe of your stamina, the Foreign Secretary. But the fact that you were so keen to come to Singapore is no surprise at all. Partly for the reason that Laura set out, uh, that Singapore is such a fantastic convening place uh, for business, for philanthropy, for think tanks, uh, for media. But also because Singapore is a really important uh, and strategic partner for the United Kingdom in this region. The Foreign Secretary has already had excellent meetings with the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister, and this evening we'll see the Foreign Minister of Singapore. And with all of them, he's talked about uh, what more we can do together on trade, on tech, on climate and sustainability, on science and research, on education and on security. You may have only had three weeks in the role, Foreign Secretary, but you have been incredibly well prepared. You have been serving the people of Braintree in Essex since 2015 as their MP, and in your maiden speech uh, in the House of Commons, uh, you said that you wanted to inspire Britain to be its best, and at its best, it is an open international trading nation. So you put down a very early marker for working in the international field. You've also been a Minister of State at the Foreign Commonwealth and Defence office. You have been uh, Education Secretary. You've had roles in Department for Exiting the European Union. Um, you've had senior roles in the party and also in the London Assembly. Now you are here to set out your vision, our vision, for the UK in the Indo-Pacific. So without further ado, I'm going to invite you all to welcome Mr. Cleverly, my boss, to the stage. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. Gosh, there's quite a few of you here. <laughs> Peter, hello. <laughs> good to see you, good to see so many of you, good to see so many of you uh, here. Uh, huge thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak with you uh, this afternoon. Um, and uh, it has been a bit of a whistle-stop uh, tour. Uh, Japan, uh, Korea, and here in uh, Singapore. 
and my body clock is still not fully uh, adjusted. So if I start uh, dozing off midway through the speech, I have an excuse. If you start dozing off midway through the speech, then I don't have an excuse at all. Um, but, uh, I mean, our, our High Commissioner highlighted the fact that I laid down an early marker that I was interested in international relations in my first speech in Parliament. But actually, my interest predates that quite significantly because I, I've, always loved, I've always loved maps, always loved maps. Uh, and I particularly loved the maps that I grew up with as a child, perhaps because the maps that I looked at when I was a child had my house right in the centre. Um, and the reason is because I grew up literally metres east of the Greenwich Meridian. So there was me in the middle, and on one edge of the map there was the west coast of the United States of America, and on the other edge of the map were the Pacific Islands, <coughs> literally on the periphery. So perhaps now it is no surprise to you that I much prefer globes. Because, because globes remind us that there is no middle, there is no edge, there is no center, there is no periphery. Every country is at the center of its own world and that we are all connected, that we all share opportunities, but we also have a duty to share the challenges. And I'm gonna talk in this speech perhaps more about challenges than opportunities, but I want you to understand that I am an optimist at heart. I know that the opportunities are many and they are great, but the challenges that we all face are diverse and they are significant. Disease and ill health, terrorism and war, epitomized most recently by Russia's brutal, illegal, and unjustified invasion of Ukraine. We see food insecurity, energy insecurity, economic insecurity, and of course, the ongoing march of climate change. And climate change is the specter that looms over all of us, and it amplifies all the challenges that we face. And these challenges cannot be solved by any one country alone, nor can they be solved by any one region alone. So when we look at our maps, or indeed our globes, we have a choice. We can either see a world divided, or we can seek to explore those things that bind us together and we can choose to recognize that geography matters less and it is our values that make us neighbors. We can see the countries which choose to be committed to trade and commerce, to those which stand up to oppression and coercion, those which seek to tackle climate change, those which look to innovation and technology to make the future better than the past. And those countries form a grid, they form a network, they form partnerships. And the UK is committed to overcoming the challenges that I described by reinforcing those grids, strengthening those networks, building more and deeper partnerships. High Commissioner highlighted the fact that I've only been in the job for three weeks. Immediately prior to that, I was the Secretary of State for Education for nine weeks. <laughs> I'm, hoping to, uh, I'm hoping to outlast that appointment. But I tell you something, the three weeks, I, the three weeks that I've had have been, have been pretty intense. Um, but it has given me the opportunity to meet with uh, world leaders and my foreign affairs counterparts. 
Please tell me I'm not the only one that can hear that, is there? <laughs> Uh, I've had the privilege of meeting world leaders and my international uh, counterparts from across the globe. Firstly, sadly, at the occasion of the funeral of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Then, in the heady speed dating environment that is the UN General Assembly in New York, where more than uh, 190 countries come together to discuss ways to strengthen global resilience, improve food security, and boost international investments. Now, the UK is part of many networks, uh, NATO, the Commonwealth, G7, G20, to name but a few. But we are looking to build on those pre-existing networks to improve our partnerships. And our relationship with the Indo-Pacific is central to tackling those issues that I've just described. And our uh, relationship with this region will be a driving force for a positive vision of growth and security in all our countries. Now, last year in the integrated review, we set out our Indo-Pacific tilt, underlining the strategic importance that we place as the UK upon this region. And it's a region critical to our economy, to our security, and to our ambition to support open societies. Let me describe the region in a couple of statistics. At least 1.7 million British citizens live across the region. Our trading relationships are worth over $250 billion, and they're growing. In the decades to come, it will be the crucible of solutions to many of the pressing global challenges that we face, from climate change and biodiversity to maritime security and geopolitical competition linked to our rules and norms. Now, the integrated review is a document, and it's easy to put words on a page or put lines in a speech. But I want to make it clear that we are committed to making the Indo-Pacific tilt more than just a slogan, make it more than just rhetoric. And that's why we applied for and secured ASEAN dialogue partner status. The UK recognises the centrality of ASEAN to the region and the essential contribution it has made to peace, prosperity and security. And we take our responsibility to support those efforts seriously. And this includes working with partners to ensure that other initiatives complement rather than conflict with the central role of ASEAN. We were the first European country to secure a comprehensive strategic partnership with India. And we intend to be the first European country to accede to the CPTPP. Whew, got that out in one go. <laughs> and the CPTPP, twice on the trot, <laughs> will give the region access to the UK's world-class financial services sector as well uh, as well as the world's sixth largest economy. And that's why engagement between the UK and the Indo-Pacific needs to cover the broadest spectrum of activities. So let me highlight the areas where we think this relationship matters. We all want to provide jobs for our young people and opportunities for our businesses. The UK is pursuing a low-tax, high-growth economic strategy to deliver exactly this. And we're working closely with countries in the Indo-Pacific to drive prosperity and growth through new trade opportunities. We signed free trade agreements with Australia and New Zealand, and we're working intensely to, to agree one with India soon. We've also signed free trade deals with Singapore, Vietnam, the Republic of Korea, and Japan, and bilateral partnership agreements with the Republic of Korea 
and Indonesia. Within six months, just six months, we negotiated a digital economy agreement with Singapore. It sets the standards in removing friction and increasing confidence in digital trade. And just last week, over 20 of our top tech companies were here in Singapore. And when they went home, they took with them new customers, investors, and signed a number of joint ventures. And we are keen to do more. Our focus is on strengthening collaboration in science and technology, research and development just as we have done here in Singapore. But we cannot talk about economic cooperation without also talking about climate. And the importance of our relationships in the region to accelerate the world's transition to net zero. And I felt that strongly in the conversations that I had at the Partners in the Blue Pacific Initiative at the UN General Assembly. And earlier today, I met the head of our new regional hub of the British International Investment here in Singapore. BII, as we call it, is the UK's development finance arm. And through it, we intend to spend up to 500 million pounds in the region over the next five years. And we will work with public and private partners in the region to support quality green infrastructure projects in Indonesia, in Vietnam, in the Philippines, in Cambodia, and Laos. And we've also committed up to 110 million pounds to the ASEAN Catalytic Green Finance Facility to boost renewables, to boost clean transport, and to boost other sustainable infrastructure projects. Secondly, our focus on defense and security. The Indo-Pacific tilt also means recognizing that security and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific are indivisible from Europe's. We welcome the condemnation of Russia's violations of the UN Charter and the decisions made by many countries in the region, including Singapore, Japan, and the Republic of Korea, to impose sanctions on Russia for its aggression. Russia's violation of the UN Charter sets a dangerous precedent for the whole world. Peace and stability in this region matters in the UK. 60% of global trade passes through shipping routes here in the Indo-Pacific. So security here has a direct impact on households in the UK. And we're working with partners in the region to promote maritime security and uphold the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. It's 40 years old, but it still continues to play an essential role and supports ASEAN's own security strategy. And the UK has lots to offer as a defense partner. Our Prime Minister has committed to increase defense spending to 3% of GDP by 2030. Alongside the US, we are bringing world-leading submarine technology through our AUKUS partnership to support Australia's defense and security capabilities. And this will bolster regional peace and stability. And the UK is working with partners across the Indo-Pacific to strengthen cybersecurity and secure critical national infrastructure, including with ASEAN through their dedicated center here in Singapore. And thirdly, partnership through our values. The UK and many Indo-Pacific countries are committed to shared values. Our commitment to sovereignty and territorial integrity and freedom from economic coercion. Our shared beliefs in the value of democracy and open markets. The UK is committed to working with partners, old and new, in defense of those values which is why we support ASEAN's efforts to restore peace and democracy in Myanmar. And it's why we have worked so hard to respond robustly to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Because, as I said in the UN Security Council chamber just last week, if Ukraine's sovereignty and territory are not respected, then no 
country can feel itself truly secure. This region's commitment to those values has been on show at the United Nations in recent months, where it stood shoulder to shoulder with other countries around the world to condemn Russia's invasion. The international rules-based system doesn't only protect our freedoms and security, it protects fair trade and it protects us online. And when we join the CPTPP, as I hope we soon will, we will approach this work and our membership in the spirit of cooperation, looking to protect people's interests and freedoms. Now, it would be impossible to give a speech in this region and not mention China. And I was pleased to meet Foreign Minister Wang Yi in New York last week. It's important to talk even when we disagree. Actually, especially when we disagree. Because China is a major global actor and driver of growth. It has lifted literally millions of people out of poverty. But the lessons I take from watching China across my lifetime is that when China departs from global rules and norms, when it aligns itself with aggressive countries like Russia, its standing in the world suffers. Now, China will always have a choice about the direction that it wants to take. But one thing that is certain is that the UK government will always stand up for our sovereignty and economic security and that of our partners. And no UK government will ever turn a blind eye to repression wherever it occurs. All of the achievements that I've outlined today are products of partnership. And the UK is working with friends and partners to address the challenges that we face, but also to seize the opportunities ahead of us. And we are well on our way to becoming the European partner with the broadest, most integrated presence in the Indo-Pacific. And I am here to make it clear that the Indo-Pacific tilt is here to stay. It is permanent. And we have gone from strategy to delivery, from economic theory to signing trade deals, from security discussions to deploying our carrier strike group, from talking about our values to standing together in the face of Putin's invasions. And if you take nothing from this speech other than what I'm about to say, then I would be comfortable with that. Because what I'm about to say is that the UK will remain a committed, reliable partner to this region. Thank you.